you can go ahead and open up your Bibles to the book of Jonah, chapter 2. We are now in week 3 of our series in the book of Jonah that focuses on the relentless grace and mercy of our God. And just to recap what we've covered over the past two weeks, the book of Jonah opens with God commanding his prophet Jonah of the northern kingdom of Israel to go to Nineveh, the capital city of Assyria, the most powerful nation in the known world at that time. He, he commands him to go there to preach a message of judgment so that the Ninevites would turn from their evil ways, repent of their sin, and escape God's wrath. Now the Ninevites were infamous for being a brutal, oppressive, and wicked people who happened to be the sworn enemy of Israel. And so in response to God's request to go to Nineveh, Jonah in his self-righteousness and disobedience tells God no. I'm not going. And we find that Jonah's loyalty is to his comfort and his country before his creator. And so instead he boards a ship going to Tarshish, which is 2,000 miles in the opposite direction of Nineveh by sea. And it doesn't take Jonah much time to find out how foolish it is to try and escape the presence of the one true God of the universe who created the sea on the sea. And so God, we read, he hurls a massive storm at Jonah to discipline his disobedient prophet. And this storm is supernatural in nature and threatens the lives of not just Jonah, but also the pagan sailors giving Jonah passage to Tarshish. As chapter 1 unfolds, we find that Jonah plunges even deeper into his hardness of heart and self-righteousness. Jonah, in his self-centeredness, cares nothing for the lives of the sailors and shows them next to no concern. In response, the Lord shows us his heart and perfect character as well as his sovereignty and divine providence by using Jonah's disobedience to extend his grace to the sailors who cry out to God and come to saving faith. And the irony is, is that it is the pagan sailors, not God's prophet, who pursue God in prayer, humble themselves, and show grace and kindness to their neighbor. And so with Jonah persisting in his pride and self-righteousness, still digging his heels in, we are left asking the question, what's it going to take? What's it going to take for Jonah to be humbled, to recognize his sin, and to turn back to God? And as chapter 1 comes to a close, we see that the storm has had little to no effect on Jonah. He still won't pray. He refuses to recognize his sin, and there is no sign of him being willing to engage God whatsoever. And so the storm rages on and intensifies, and the sailors, they fear for their lives, and they ask Jonah, what should we do? And Jonah, in response, he plays the martyr card. And he selfishly says to them in Jonah chapter 1 verse 12, Pick me up and hurl me into the sea. Then the sea will quiet down for you. For I know it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. Despite Jonah's request, the sailors do everything in their power not to throw Jonah overboard in trying to save his life. Again, The irony is that the Gentile sailors are willing to risk great personal danger to extend grace and mercy to help Jonah. The same grace and mercy Jonah is unwilling to show to them and to the Ninevites. It becomes abundantly clear that the storm is part of God's plan to discipline his prophet. And so the sailors acquiesce and throw Jonah overboard, causing the storm to immediately cease. This now brings us to Jonah chapter 2 in our passage this morning. Jonah chapter 2 is a beautiful Hebrew poem where Jonah is humbled 
by God's loving discipline and expresses his sincere thanks to the Lord for saving his life. And while at face value, this seems like the neat and tidy Hollywood story of redemption that we all crave, as we look at Jonah chapter 2 more closely, especially in light of Jonah's actions in the chapters that follow, we come to see that this psalm of praise is not absent of protest. As Jonah continues to be at odds with the Lord in his stubborn, self-righteous refusal to show grace to the Ninevites. And so as we come to our passage this morning in Jonah chapter 2, the text is going to present us with three questions. I'd like to look together with you guys this morning. Number one, what is it going to take? What is it going to take for Jonah to be humbled, recognize his sin, and turn back to God? Number two, will Jonah ever remember God's calling on his life? Now, all of us, to a certain degree, we suffer from what I like to call spiritual amnesia. That we have the habit of forgetting who our God is and what he has saved us from and what he has saved us for. And tragically, there are some of us that never come to that understanding and, and will refuse to receive God's gift of salvation. And so we come to Jonah and we ask, will Jonah ever remember and receive God's calling on his life to be his prophet? Lastly, number three, does Jonah get it? Does Jonah get it? As chapter 2 comes to a close, the text forces us to ask, has Jonah truly repented of his sin? Is it sincere? Has he sincerely trusted in God? Is he ready to walk in obedience? Or is this psalm of praise just empty, pious, fluffy words with no substance behind them? And so with all that being said, let's begin looking at our passage this morning by reading Jonah chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. The text says, Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish, saying, I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. Then I said, I am driven away from your sight, yet I shall again look upon your holy temple. So immediately we are provided with this poetic and descriptive imagery of what happens next after Jonah is thrown overboard. The waves crash over him. He becomes submerged under the water. And as he sinks to the bottom of the ocean floor, it seems almost certain he's going to drown. Gasping for air. And fighting for his life, Jonah is met with the cold, hard reality that he is not in control. There's no escape from the circumstances that he has brought upon himself. There's no place left to run. And so this brings us to the first question in our study this morning. What is it going to take for Jonah to be humbled, recognize his sin, and turn back to God? Well, here Jonah finds himself at the bottom of the sea, at the bottom of the ocean floor. He literally cannot sink any deeper. And nearing the point of death, we see that Jonah finally relents. He's been broken. Jonah has been humbled, frantic and fearful. Jonah cries out to the Lord to save him. We read in Jonah chapter 1, verse 17, And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. God, in his relentless grace and mercy, miraculously rescues Jonah using a great fish to swallow him whole. God commands the fish, hey, fish, no chewing. Just swallow this guy whole. And so Jonah finds himself in the midst of some interesting surroundings, to say 
the least. And so that is the setting of Jonah chapter 2. That Jonah is talking to us from the belly of the fish. Yet as chapter 2 unfolds, there isn't one ounce of grumbling or complaining from Jonah. We see that he's just happy to be alive. And he praises God for his deliverance and opportunity at a second chance. For Jonah, it took for him to feel like he was in the belly of Sheol. What is described in the Old Testament as the place of the departed dead. To stop running from God. For the Lord to get his attention and recognize God's presence in his life. And so the text now poses to us the very same question of what is asked of Jonah. What's it going to take? What is it going to take for some of us to cease our rebellion, to stop running away from God, and to turn to him for deliverance? For some of us, we might be in a place right now where it feels like we're drowning. It feels like we're trying to gasp for air every single day. But despite our best efforts, we continue to spiral downward. And we may even find ourselves, some of us, at rock bottom. Is God dealing you a severe mercy right now? Is God dealing you a severe mercy right now? A severe mercy is a trial which God uses redemptively in our lives to humble us, bring us to the end of ourselves so that we turn away from our sin and turn to God before we meet our demise. Author and pastor Crawford Loritz writes, The usual place to learn the secrets of God's grace is usually at the bottom. Most of us came to Jesus because we were feeling and tasting the bottom. We were in over our heads. We came to the realization that we are not that great. We are not in control. And life is overwhelming. We come to a place where God's grace and mercy has to step in. Sometimes a trial or a severe mercy can be of our own doing, like in the case of Jonah. And other times we are the victims of someone else's sinful actions, like in the case of the pagan sailors. Regardless, it is a painful and tremendously difficult place to be, and the effects are just the same. But the good news is that God brings trials into our lives with the redemptive purpose of molding us into his image for our good and for his glory. When we are brought to such a place where there is nowhere else to turn, Except to God, we learn that God can be trusted, that God is faithful, and that he loves us with a perfect love where he will never leave us or forsake us. We recognize the eternal and abundant life that we crave can only be found in him. And so we joyfully surrender our lives to Jesus in making him our Lord and Savior. You know, it was just three weeks ago that we had the blessing of capping off our summer and outdoor services with a baptism service. And it, it really was. It was a special, special day. It was beyond spectacular. And we gathered together as God's people to celebrate the Lord's relentless grace and mercy and steadfast love in the lives of five precious individuals of our church family, Wayne and Amy Pagliarulo, Larry Baccio, Annie Pinquet, and Tim Best. And and so when you see them, make sure you encourage them. You continue to encourage them. You continue to come alongside them. Make sure you're praying for them. And when you're praying for them, let them know that they are being prayed for. And and so if you were paying attention when they were giving their, their testimonies, you'd realize that the common denominator, when when they were giving their just beautiful and magnificent salvation stories, the common denominator was that God had used a severe mercy in each and every one of their lives to get their attention, for them to stop running from God, and bring them to the place where they were able to recognize God's love for them. Yet we have to understand that severe mercy is at the center of our faith. 
That it is at the cross where we encounter the ultimate severe mercy. It is through Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection that baptism symbolizes that God offers us newness of life. This is the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The very language Jesus uses for his death, burial, and resurrection is the sign of Jonah. The sign of Jonah. We read in Matthew chapter 12, verse 40, For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. When we encounter a severe mercy in our lives, it is meant for our good and for God's glory in turning us away from our sin and back to God. When we come to verse 4, Jonah says, I am driven away from your sight, yet I shall again look upon your holy temple. The Hebrew word for look here, nabat, intimates a turning and looking back to God. That the presence of the Lord resided in the temple. And so what Jonah is saying here is that what has happened to him, it has stopped him dead in his tracks. And now his gaze has, has, has turned. Now he's again, once again, looking, he's focusing, he's turned towards the presence of the Lord. Even when we find ourselves driven away from God's sight by being hurled into the chaos that comes with turning away from God's presence, even when we feel like we've hit rock bottom, God in his grace and mercy will use our disobedience redemptively if we let him, if we let him, if we respond in repentance, that God is always exhorting us that when we hit bottom, he's exhorting us, he's encouraging us to look up, to turn away from our sin and to turn back to God in welcoming his presence into our lives. And so let's go ahead now and move forward to the second question we find in our text this morning where God addresses Jonah's spiritual amnesia. And so will Jonah ever remember God's calling on his life? Let's go ahead and read Jonah chapter 2 verses 5 through 8. We read, The waters closed in over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped around about my head at the roots of the mountains. I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. Yet you brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. When my life was fainting away, I remembered the Lord. And my prayer came to you into your holy temple. Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. You guys all know how, what a big movie fan I am. And at the top of my list of favorite movies is the movie Hook. I'm telling you, parents, if you have not yet had a family movie night with your kids and watched Hook, what are you waiting for? Okay, maybe it's family movie night tonight, okay? Hook is one of my favorite family movies, and it builds off of the story of Peter Pan. And in the film, Peter has grown up, and he has been away from Neverland now for so long that he forgets his identity. He forgets his past. And over time, Peter, he becomes everything that he hates. He's this ruthless, workaholic lawyer who neglects his family, and he has no time for his kids. He ends up being dragged off to Neverland by Tinkerbell after Captain Hook kidnaps his kids. And in order to rescue them, he has to become Peter Pan again. And so the lost boys, they have to cure him of his amnesia. I know, it's a great plot to a movie. you got to watch it. But the key that ends up unlocking Peter's amnesia is remembering his first love. And it's just beautiful. You see, the reason why he left Neverland in the first place was his desire to be a father. It was his desire to be part of a family. And so Peter 
remembers his love for his children. He remembers that his children are his first love. In verses 5 and 6, we see how Jonah's deliverance cures him of his spiritual amnesia, causing him to say in verse 7, When my life was fainting away, I remembered, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came to you into your holy temple. Jonah finally remembers who God is, how God has rescued him from death and to be a prophet and herald of his word. Jonah remembers and rediscovers his first love. The theme of remembering is one of the most prominent and important themes we see throughout the entire Bible. Over and over again, peppered throughout the Old Testament, we see the Lord calling his people to remember his covenant faithfulness. That God makes a covenant with his people, Israel. And the word that we come across over and over again in the Old Testament is the Hebrew word chesed. And chesed, it describes God's covenant faithfulness and his steadfast love. You see, God's love, biblical love, is way different than, than how we use the term love in our society. To us, when we say love, we describe a feeling. And feelings, as you know, they come and go. But with God, love is a choice. Love is an action. Love is a commitment that even when we don't feel like it, even when people, others, don't love us back, right, God chooses to love us. His love is a steadfast love. It's a love we can depend upon. It, it's a love that we can rely on. It's a love that we can rest in. And so we see this theme of remembering over and over again in the Old Testament, remembering the covenant faithfulness, the steadfast love of our God. And whether it be how the Lord brought Egypt, the most powerful nation in the world at that time, to its very knees to rescue his people out of slavery. Or to remember how the Lord provided for his people even when they grumbled against him in the wilderness. Or remembering how God brought his people by the hand into the promised land, and back from exile. We see that remembrance is a vital part of our faith. And this moves forward into the New Testament. In the New Testament, this call to remembrance of God's steadfast love is ultimately fulfilled in Jesus Christ at the cross. The Lord Jesus provides us with two ordinances. Two ordinances that he commands of us as his church. The first is baptism, which we already spoke to this morning. And the other is a call to remembrance of God's steadfast love and covenant faithfulness when we celebrate communion. We read in Luke chapter 22, verses 19 through 20, And Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup, after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. It is at the communion table where... We remember Jesus delivering us from sin through his sacrificial death, making atonement for our sins, and his resurrection power that defeated sin and death forever. When we celebrate the Lord's Supper, we remember Christ's perfect love for us and what he saved us from and what he saved us for. In the same way we memorialize momentous events in our history as a nation, this is God's way of saying to us, Never forget. Never forget. Never forget what I've rescued you from. Never forget where you were before my presence was in your life. Never forget how much I loved you. How I loved you while you were still a sinner. Why I loved you when you were still unlovable. Never forget. Never forget who I am. And in the midst of the grind of our everyday lives, it's easy to forget, isn't it? It's easy to forget. And so that's why we must always return to the cross and return to our first love. We need to remember our first love, Jesus Christ. And how when we were still sinners, Christ chose to give himself up for us. 
Jonah's deliverance causes him to remember God's faithfulness and steadfast love, which Jonah speaks to in verse 8. And he says, those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. Jonah boldly proclaims that lifeless idols cannot compare to the steadfast love of the Lord. You cannot find steadfast love anywhere else unless you go to Jesus Christ. There is no idol, there is no thing, there is no relationship where you can find steadfast love except in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so what Jonah is saying here is, is why would I go to anything else? There's nowhere else to go. But to God, my hope is in the Lord. My hope is in his steadfast love. This is the only source there is for steadfast love. And so this causes a turn to take place in Jonah's heart. And we see that there, that there is. There's, there's a, a, the beginning of a change where, where Jonah is starting to turn away from his rebellion towards the Lord once again. Something is, is, is happening here. And so this brings us to our third and final question in our text this morning. Does Jonah get it? Does Jonah get it? Is he for real? And for what we've seen so far in chapter 2, we'd have to say, so far so good. Jonah has displayed an overwhelmingly thankful heart in crafting this psalm of praise for thanking the Lord for sparing his life. But the question is, is he truly a changed man? And for Jonah, and for all of us as well, the only thing we can say is, we'll see. We'll see. How do we respond? How do we act? Right? Because biblical, biblical repentance is not just saying we're sorry. Biblical repentance is an action. Right? It is a turning away from our sin. And so this brings us to the conclusion of our passage this morning. And so let's go ahead and read the the end of the chapter here, Jonah chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. We read, But I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. And the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah out upon the dry land. As we come to the conclusion... Of chapter 2. At first glance, it seems as though Jonah has finally received and learned the lesson the Lord has been trying to teach him. In verse 9, Jonah says, what I have vowed, I will pay. Jonah's offering of thanksgiving and praise to the Lord is fulfilling his vow as a prophet in obedience to the Lord by going to Nineveh to preach God's message of judgment and repentance to the Ninevites. Jonah's psalm ends with a great crescendo as Jonah declares, salvation belongs to the Lord. It seems as though Jonah, he finally gets it. That this is the point God has been trying to make all along and get Jonah to realize from the very beginning of the book that salvation belongs to the Lord. It doesn't belong to Jonah. It doesn't belong to you. It doesn't belong to me. Salvation belongs to the Lord. And how self-righteous and arrogant do we have to be in trying to tell our creator, the God of heaven and earth and the author of salvation, who is deserving or undeserving to be saved. It's not for us to say. Salvation is not for ours to give. And therefore, it's not for us to say. Salvation, it belongs to the Lord. It's God's grace. It's God's salvation. And it is at that moment where the fish spits Jonah out unceremoniously on to dry land. Now, what a great place this would be to end the book, right? Be so great. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Boom, let's close the book. Or how about even better? Salvation belongs to the Lord. Jonah's spit out by the fish. The Ninevites, they all come to the Lord. Jonah's super happy. Let's close the book, right? We could just put a bow on it. And we could just say, and everyone lived happily ever after. And sadly, many children's books and many children's Bibles, they try and do just that. That you'll see in many children's Bibles, they take Jonah 4 
Jonah chapter 4, out of the book, which totally distorts the message of the book, totally changes the message of the book and messes with the integrity of the word of God. I guess there are those, those editors who feel like we can't handle it for some reason, the, mess, the true message of the, the book of Jonah. Well, Jonah chapter 4, it is in the book. And when we read ahead to chapters 3 and 4, we see that Jonah doesn't change whatsoever. He persists in his self-righteousness. He does everything in his power to sabotage his prophetic mission to Nineveh. And his anger towards God becomes so great that he tells God in Jonah chapter 4 verse 9 that he is angry enough to die. Does Jonah get it? Not so much. Jonah doesn't get it. And so knowing all of that, what are we to make of this supposed psalm of praise here in chapter 2? Well, a careful reading of chapter 2 will uncover that while Jonah, he is sincere in his praise and thanksgiving for the Lord, saving his life. There is an affection of, 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 for God, but he never recognizes or confesses his sin. And so moving forward, we will see that Jonah is as self-righteous as ever. He begrudgingly fulfills his vow and is steadfast in his refusal to show the Ninevites any grace or compassion. And so we could kind of say that Jonah is all talk and no action. As a prophet, he is gifted at putting together these pious, poetic prayers. But he cannot bring himself to show the love and grace of God to anyone outside of his people group. And he's unwilling to surrender to the will of God in his life. Commentator James Bruckner writes, Jonah is making vows, but he is not repentant. He recalls his trust in Yahweh, yet he shows few signs of real trust. He has expressed thanks for the fact that he is still breathing, but that is all. He uses a flourish of words for his own deliverance, but has only a few reticent words for the Ninevites and sailors. Jonah's attitude and protest against the Ninevites has not relented. And his self-righteousness towards foreigners, it's still the same. Jonah gives thanks and praise to the Lord for saving his life, while simultaneously refusing to repent for running, because his basic beliefs, they haven't changed. Jonah still does not want Nineveh to have the opportunity to repent. And as we talked about last week, the book of Jonah is designed to function as a mirror. And so we're tempted once again to become self-righteous and feel superior to Jonah. But the truth is, is that Jonah's story is our story. What we find here in Jonah chapter 2 is, is that Jonah is a work in progress. Jonah is in process. What we find is someone who is ready to praise God while protesting his will in their lives. Sound familiar? See, when we look into the mirror that is the book of Jonah and the word of God, what we see is our own reflection. Right? This is the process of sanctification where we're wrestling with our faith. We're wrestling with God and we're like, we read the scriptures and we're like, yeah, God, I like this. But that, not so much. So where do we go from here? Where do we go from here? I'll tell you where we go. We go right back to the heart and central message of the book. We never stop needing the relentless grace and mercy of God in our lives. The truth is none of us have arrived. And none of us ever will until we are face to face with God in glory. That's why there is a never-ending demand for us to saturate our lives in the gospel. Author and pastor J.D. Greer writes, For many evangelicals, the gospel functions solely as the entry right into Christianity. It is the prayer we pray to begin our relationship with Jesus. The diving board off of which we jump into the pool of the real Christian life. The gospel, however, is not just the diving board off of which we jump into the pool of Christianity. It is the pool itself. It is not only the way we begin in Christ, it is the way we grow in Christ. That's why growth in Christ is never going beyond the gospel, but going deeper into the gospel. The purest waters from the spring of life are found by digging deeper, not wider, 
into the gospel well. And so, just like Jonah, we should be encouraged greatly by God's deliverance in our lives. But at the same time, we need to be careful that we don't fall into the trap of self-righteousness in thinking that we have somehow arrived. And so if you think you've graduated from the gospel, you are greatly deceived. If you think you don't need to be part of a local church to grow and live out your faith, and you could just watch the worship service forever on a screen, and, and that you don't have to be in biblical community to have other people calling you back to Jesus and speaking the gospel into your life, you are greatly deceived. And the greatest deception of all is the notion that we've arrived at a place where our thoughts and our attitudes no longer have to be challenged by the word of God. The truth is we need God's relentless grace found in the gospel every single day. Jonah chapter 2 is a call for us to humble ourselves, recognize our daily need for God's grace and mercy, and to never stop preaching the gospel to ourselves as we allow God to penetrate the unreached parts of our character with his transforming love, grace, and power. And so Jonah has taken a great step in the right direction. He has begun to look towards God. His piety is real, but so is his protest. And what we'll find in chapters 3 and 4 is that God is not finished working on our buddy Jonah. That Jonah can continue to wrestle with God, but he cannot continue to run. And the truth is, God isn't done working with me and you either. God desire is for us to turn our hearts towards him. That these areas where we're struggling in, that we bring them before the Lord and we allow the Lord to, to sanctify us, right? To, to wrestle with the Lord, to dig into his word, to be in biblical community and to work these things out, to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. And so if you find yourself in the belly of the beast, please know that there is nowhere to hide from the presence of the Lord. The truth is, is that God is not done with any of us. The time has come to stop walking in pride and to begin walking in humility. That we need to call out to the Lord, knowing the blessing of his grace and mercy and the power of his deliverance so that you too can boldly proclaim salvation belongs to the Lord.